I'm humbly grateful tonight to have opportunity to stand before this great audience. I'm subdued. The power of your spirit that comes forth from you humbles me. And so tonight I'm aware that without the Lord's help you really can't do anything. And I've prayed that he'd bless me and I've prayed that he'd bless you. Because a lot of what will happen here tonight will be dependent on the Spirit that comes through you and from you. I found over the years that when the people come seeking with their cups up and the Lord's Spirit works through them, it's much easier to bring the message. And so I'd hope there might be a prayer in your heart that the Lord would help us, that your time won't be wasted. I'm excited tonight to see these wonderful missionaries assembled here. It's about 1,800, President Christensen said. That's about the number that I supervise now in the eastern part of the United States. I've never had them all together like this. And so it's, uh, and I'm aware of the special spirit they have as they're set apart. And then there are many return missionaries here. And so I really am humbled tonight to be here with you. But I am grateful to have an opportunity to raise my voice as a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this is really a great day to live. It's exciting the things the Lord's doing. It's exciting to see Him moving to establish His work in the earth. I don't know whether you're aware or not, but we're still a very small minority when you think that there's somewhere between four and five billion people in the world and we just now reached the five million mark, which means that we're one-tenth of one percent. And you know, the odds would be against us if it weren't that nothing's too hard for the Lord. But because He's there and nothing's too hard, we can carry this message to the ends of the earth. Now, as I'm in the presence of you wonderful young people, I've been aware, and I am aware tonight, that the Lord is sending some of the finest spirits that have ever come to earth. As I go about and meet uh, particularly the missionaries across the earth, I find that they're superior to the generation I was born in. And so tonight I salute you. I'd like you to know that we're proud of you. And more than that, I'd hope you could feel that we have a love and respect for you. And we're just grateful that you're here. And we're anxious to do all we can to assist you and to help you in this task that the Lord has set before us. You know, this day we live in is really a great day. It's different than other days. Elias, the prophet, spoke about the restoration of all things. That's not only the power and authority of the gospel, that's also the restoration of all the evil that's been in the earth. Can you see what a challenge we have as we come down here now to the wind-up scene? The battle in heaven wasn't won there. All they've done is change the location of the battlefield, and it's been transferred down here. And what an honor, what a privilege for you wonderful young people to think that the Lord had confidence enough in you that He would allow you to come in this day. You know, this will be the only time in the history of the church in the years the earth has been in existence that it won't have been thrown down or given to another people. But the Lord spoke through Daniel and said that he would cut a little stone out of the mountain without hands, and it would roll forth until it filled the whole earth. And it would not be thrown down or given to another people. And I feel myself with the help of the Lord and with those He's sending in this day, that is possible. And so you who are of the first team, you who are the elect of God, I address you tonight and say that you have a heavy responsibility upon you. There are many who are counting on you not to fail. And the Lord has said, where much is given, much is required. You know, many have given much that we could be here and have what we have. Now, one of the thrilling things this past uh, week, Sister Eve and I have had opportunity to spend some days where the church was organized. We are back at the pageant. We were in the sacred grove. You can't be in that sacred place and not know that something special happened there. That feeling that's there, 
unless you're totally dead to the Spirit, lets you know that you're on holy ground. Just like Moses must have felt when he approached the burning bush, when the Lord said to him, Moses, remove the shoes from off thy feet, for the ground on which thou standest is holy ground. And I'm glad Joseph Smith didn't fail. When we read and study what he had, to, the challenges he had to face, I'm grateful that he was, had the strength he did and he had the trust he had in the Lord. How do we felt about him if he'd have failed? How do we felt if the pioneers had have failed? You know, I never fly from Salt Lake back across those plains, but what I think in my mind's eye and in my mind picture those men and women struggling across that 11 or 1200 mile expanse, bleeding feet, short of food, not knowing for sure where they'll be the next day, crossing rivers without a bridge. And when I see what they had to do, and we got a little taste of it as President Bushnell indicated, we know what it is to be in the desert, as I'm in some of those areas where you don't have to irrigate, and the water comes down automatically, and all you have to do is harvest the crop after you've planted it. I imagine there were some, those might have had some second thoughts when they came here where nothing grows except you pour the water on it. I'm grateful that they didn't fail. Many noble men and women have made it possible for us to have the blessings we have. And just two years ago, the prophet of God spoke to the church and said, the church is now strong enough to begin to move forth in a major way. You see, all those years before, we've been trying to gather enough strength just to exist. It took a hundred years to get the first 100 stakes. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and John Taylor and Lorenzo Snow, Wilford Woodruff, Joseph F. Smith, and for part of the time Heber J. Grant never presided over more than 100 stakes. In 1930, the 100 stake was organized. And do you know, since President Kimball has been the prophet in 1974 until now, 1982, there have been 722 stakes organized in eight years. There were 630 when he became the prophet. Can you just get a feel now that the kingdom of God is beginning to move out across the earth? And you know, when the kingdom of God begins to increase in power and strength and begins to move forth, also the power of the adversary increases. And he's not asleep. You know, I, I've learned that there's one good thing that I could say about him. He isn't lazy. You know, he's that, he's, he's, uh, he works day and he works night, and he is always there. And it's interesting that some of the new temples are being uh, placed to see the attention we're getting from some of his helpers. You can be aware that something important is happening there because of the attention we're getting from other sources. So in this day, if we're going to do our part, we need to live better. We need to be closer to the Lord. We need to be more diligent than any group have ever been. With the fact that all the evil is being restored. You see, when we talk about the restoration of the fullness of gospel, we talk about a plan that made it possible for Enoch to establish a Zion, a place which the Scripture indicates. Let me read you what the Scripture says about it. They were of one heart and one mind. They dwelled in righteousness, and they were no poor among them. And Zion was not, for the Lord took her unto himself. That same plan, those same principles are here. And if we can prepare ourselves so we can be a celestial people, because Zion can only be set up on the the principles of the celestial kingdom, otherwise the, the Lord can't receive her unto himself. Also, the same evils that were there when the Lord, in his anger, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, those same evils are being returned. 
Can you see then from this that to live and exist in this day that we need to put the Lord first in our lives? That we need to live so that we have His power? Have you ever wondered what makes the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints different than other churches? You know there's over a thousand Christian churches. Why are we different? What is it that we have? Joseph Smith answered that question to President Martin Van Buren as he waited on him at one time asking for redress for the losses the saints had suffered. Martin Van Buren, the president, said to him, What makes you different than the other churches? And his answer was, We have the Holy Ghost. And I don't know whether you know what a marvelous blessing it is to have the Holy Ghost or not, but it makes it possible for a person to be born spiritually so that we are actually back in the presence of God through the Holy Ghost. As I see the struggle today, I see the adversary making great efforts to cut us off from the Holy Ghost, to cut us off from this power that puts us in communication with the Lord, that isolates us so that He can destroy us. He gets us to do the things so that our power is gone. You see, a missionary out in the field without the Spirit is as, help, is as helpless as a soldier with a gun without any ammunition. When converts are made, it's only when spirit speaks to spirit. You know, you can talk a person into the church, but if you talk them in, they can be talked out or they'll fall out. It's, the real conversion comes when spirit speaks to spirit, when they have this marvelous witness from the Holy Ghost that it's true. Now, I've been on both sides of the fence. I can remember a time when I didn't know. Now, I've been raised—I'm a five-generation Latter-day Saint. All of our people have been—most of our people have been in the Church since Joseph Smith. Every one of Sister Eve and my ancestors crossed the plains as pioneers. We've had—the Lord has blessed us abundantly, and I've been aware that I've had many blessings, and I'm riding on a ticket that someone else paid for, and it's kept me mighty humble. But you know, this force that can cut us off also can keep us from knowing. Now, being raised in the Latter-day Saint home, we prayed, Dad and Mother prayed. Dad was in the bishopric all the years I can remember. He was a counselor for the 13 years I can remember him as a, as a child before I went away from home. I can remember going away to school now. When Brother Bushnell talked about Millard County, you know, we lived there during the Depression, and it was hard. And I determined that I didn't want to be there anymore. You'd work all year. You'd get up at 5 o'clock and work till 9 o'clock, and when the season was over, you owed more than you did when you began in the, in the spring. I'd worked all summer. I'd been paid a dollar a day. I'd saved every cent I'd earned. And that's different than we do today. I hadn't spent one cent. I wanted to go to school. I had $96.35. Before I went away, I came to the bishop, and I said, Bishop, tomorrow I'm going away to school. I've worked all summer. I've saved all that I earned. I have $96.35. Do you think the Lord would expect me to pay tithing on that when I need so much more to go to school and there's no other place to get any? This great bishop, and I'll be grateful to him forever, looked right in my face, my eye, and said, You pay your tithing. You'll have what you need when you need it. I went home and got the, the money, those nine dollars. As I carried them down, they got bigger as I got closer to his office, until when I got to the desk, they were almost as big as wheels. And as the greatest trial I'd had to that point was to put them on his desk. And I still have the receipt in my safety deposit box. <laughs> I went away to school now. I rode in the back of a grain truck to get there. One of the first things that happened to me, I sat in a class where a learned man said, God is dead, and I was shaken up. 
I was depending on him now. The bishop said he was going to help me. <laughs> and this learned man said that thinking people, anyone with intellect, would know that God's dead. We didn't have a telephone home. I couldn't call dad and mother to be reassured. I hadn't met the new bishop yet. These pillars that held my house up had fallen down, and I needed to know. I can still remember that night. No place to go but my knees. There alone in a little one-room apartment, I kneeled down. No fancy words, something like this. Father Nevin, Dad and Mom have been praying to you all these days. This learned man says you're dead. I need to know, are you there? Well, when I went back to his class, I knew something he didn't know. I knew there was a God. I knew he could hear, and I knew that he could answer. And from that hour till now, that assurance has been like an anchor to my soul. And so I just say, if you haven't a witness so that you know, if you can only believe, I'd hope that you'd make the effort. The Lord's provided us your means in this sacred record which came forth in the hill Cumorah. As I stood in the Grandin building where it was printed just the other day, they've now made that a visitor center, actually the very place the book was printed, I got a confirmation again that this is the record the Lord brought forth, and it's the only book that has a promise that I know of in the world. The Lord has given a promise that if you really want to know, that if you'll ask with sincere heart, if you have a sincere heart, and I'll ask with a real intent, having faith in Christ, that He'll reveal the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can know the truth of all things. If I, if I could say to you, if you don't have that witness, I would encourage you to work until you have it. It'll change your life. It'll bring meaning and purpose into the things you do. It'll change your goals. It'll give you a direction. It'll bring joy and peace and satisfaction that can't be had in any other way. It'll bring a satisfaction that'll be like an anchor to you in these days when the world is confused. And so let me talk a moment now about the Holy Ghost and what I feel the adversary is trying to do to cut us off from this witness that makes it so we can know. You see, the Holy Ghost can only dwell in a clean tabernacle. There's an eternal law that this being and his influence cannot dwell in an impure tabernacle. Our body is the tabernacle, and if anything's impure in it, I don't know whether you're aware or not, but the, the memory banks in our mind are part of our body. And if they're, if they're stained or defiled, they resist that spirit, and it will withdraw and be restrained, flowing to us. Can you just see maybe a reason why the adversary is flooding the world with all the material that's out across the land? In the nation, Sister Eve and I traveled in, we didn't see one that wasn't afflicted with this plague across the whole earth. What's printed on the printed page? What's in the magazines? What's in the music? Some of the music, I better say. Can't go to a show really anymore. Unless you want to have those images and thoughts come into your mind. Let me just read you here from the Scripture. And I turn to the Doctrine and Covenants in the 63rd section. And I would just like to read you what the Lord says about having the Spirit. And what, what, what can happen if we allow something in our mind, just thought now. It's in the 63rd section in the 16th verse. And verily I say unto you, as I have said before, he that looketh on a woman to lust after her, or if any shall commit adultery in their hearts, they shall not have the Spirit, but shall deny the faith and shall fear. Now, the word shall not to me doesn't mean maybe. That means a definitely. It's talking about the Holy Ghost, only what we allow in our mind. Can you see then why the adversary might be making such an effort to cut us off from the power we have? to set up the kingdom of God in the earth, to have communication, to have our own revelation from the Lord, to have our own guidance. I would hope 
that each one of us might guard our mind and not allow anything in it that will defile our bodies so that we can be pure and sweet and holy, so this Spirit can radiate from us. The Scripture says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This door to our mind can only be controlled by us and the Lord. Your parents can't control it. Your bishop can't control it. The Lord could, but he won't, because he's given us agency. And so we alone determine what we allow to come into our conscious mind, to be stored there like it was stored in a computer, to be brought out whenever the Spirit touches us. What a challenge then to live in this day. And if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we need to guard what comes into our minds. Now one of the things I might just say to you, the Lord's given us an answer how we can protect ourselves in this evil day. He's talked about putting on an armor to protect us against an unseen foe that you can't see with your eyes ordinarily or you don't hear with your ears, but He still has such marvelous power that He can keep you from the presence of the Lord, from having the full power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. I'd, I'd just like to turn now and read to you from the Doctrine and Covenants what the Lord says to do to put this protective power upon you. And I turn to the 27th section and the 15th verse on down through the 18th. And he's talking now how we can protect ourselves in this evil day. He says, Wherefore, lift up your hearts and rejoice, and gird up your loins, and take upon you my whole armor. That's the Lord now saying, Take upon you my armor, my whole armor, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all that ye may be able to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, what does that mean? How do you do that? What are the loins? Well, scripturally, the loins represent this power the Lord's given His children to, to initiate new life. The loins are located right back between your hip bones and your short ribs. And they represent it this great power that the Lord has given us. Now, what has the Lord said to do? He said, gird your loins with truth. Now, truth is the knowledge of things as they were, as they are, and as they will be to come. Now, if you gird something, what do you do? Well, if I were going to gird my wrist, I would wrap with a handkerchief. I'd just wrap this handkerchief around it like that and tighten it, and that would brace and strengthen my wrist. The Lord says to gird your loins with truth. What does that mean? Well, to me, that means that you would take truth, that's the facts as they are, and understand this sacred power the Lord has given each one of His children, when it's to be used, how it's to be used, so that actually it would be protected and strengthened. And so you won't be caught in this web that Lucifer is spreading across the whole earth. Now in this next verse he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now the word girt, G-I-R-T, what does that mean? Well, if you look in Webster Dictionary, you'll find that it means the mooring, like you're mooring a ship, with a taut line, two cables, so that they would be so secured that the wind or the waves couldn't move the ship. To have your loins girt about with truth means that you would have them so securely bound by your understanding and your commitment to yourself that the temptations that roll over the earth and the pressures that come on from peer groups would not be able to move you and carry you away. Isn't it interesting now the Lord has placed that first in the armor? Now, I don't know whether you really can understand he's talking about armor, but if you could have been with Sister Eve and I at Warwick Castle in England, and President Sister Hyde will understand what we're talking about, there were suits of armor setting, sitting there that people wore one day. Now, they were to protect them against arrows 
and stones and axes and swords and spears. They're there. In our day, the Lord's talking about a, an armor now that will protect us against an unseen foe. I goes on and says, the next piece to put on. He says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate would be this part that comes over your chest that protects your heart and your lungs. See, you couldn't live very long without a heart. You couldn't, if you got an arrow through your heart, you'd have to stop fighting in those days. <laughs> if you got one through an arm, you probably could go on and fight with the other arm. The heart's a vital part. Now tonight we have Dr. Russell Nelson here. He's a great heart surgeon. I'm so grateful to him. If it hadn't have been for his skill and the help of the Lord, Sister Eve wouldn't be here tonight. I'm grateful to him because he extended her life by his skill and his know-how in an open-heart surgery. Well, the Lord said, cover these protective, these vital, vital parts so that they won't be injured. Now, what do we, how do we do that in our lives? How do you do that with this unseen armor? Well, my answer to that would be that we need to keep the commandments of the Lord. If I can, let me just walk you back through one commandment, and let's talk about the word of wisdom for a moment. The Lord has given us a commandment. He said this in preface to it. He says, Because of the evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of the conspiring men in the last days, I warn you and forewarn you. And he gives us a word of wisdom saying, don't use alcohol, don't use cigarettes, don't drink tea or coffee. And I would add today, don't use drugs. And I'm talking about the kind that you would know. They can destroy you, and at least the, the least thing they'll do is cut you off from the Holy Ghost. Because having made a covenant with the Lord, you'll keep His commandments. If you knowingly uh, violate your, the trust the Lord's placed in you, he cuts you off from the Spirit. Someone might say to you, well, one cigarette won't hurt you, but I want to tell you what it'll do. If you've gone into the waters of baptism and promised the Lord that you would keep His commandment, if you knowingly violate that, the Holy Ghost can't be in a, in a disobedient tabernacle. And that's what it costs. They might tell you that that little much nicotine wouldn't hurt your body, but the real loss comes when you sever yourself from the the full flow of the Spirit of the Lord, and gradually it'll ebb out until you'll be in darkness. Now, let me tell you about one person who honored and kept this commandment, and the Lord's given a great promise with it. This young man, just old enough now to go to college, this particular day he was attending the funeral of his father, and after the funeral his mother and his sister and he visited together for a few minutes, and they made a promise to one another that they wouldn't uh, break the word of wisdom unless they were all three together, and they determined it was all right to do it. He goes away to school. He went back to the University of Pennsylvania to learn to be a dentist. This Now he's in the fourth year. He's on the track team. In fact, he's the captain of the track team. And they're going up to Harvard University in Boston for the national competition. They're in Boston in the hotel. And this night, here comes the coach, a man that he loves, comes in and says, this is a great day in my life. I've been dreaming all my life to have a championship track team. We have a chance now to be the national champions. So tonight, I've brought a, a bottle of special wine here. And you know, it'll tone up your body. I want you to forget your silly Mormon notions and uh, have some tonight so you'll be in top shape. Well, this young man loved the coach. He'd do anything he asked him to do. But he said, Coach, I can't do it. And the coach went away offended. But the next morning, there was an anxious knock on his door. And his name was called out. And he answered, What's the matter? The coach says, Are you all right? He says, yes, I'm all right. Well, thank goodness. Every other member of the team is sick. He goes out alone now to defend the University of Pennsylvania in the track meet. And he runs the 100-yard dash and the 220-yard dash. And ordinarily in a track meet, they have a, 
When they run the, ra- the dashes, they have a field event in between. This particular time now, he'd run the 100 yards and in, in, in the qualifying heats and been through that. He'd now just run the qualifying heat for the 220, and immediately they announced the finals. He was tired. He was trying to get his breath. He went to the official and protested and said, "We need to, you're supposed to have a field event. They said, the crowds are restless and the field events are all done, and if you want to participate, you'll have to go now. It's been announced. And so in that condition, he goes to his lane, and he said, all the tired feeling went away. And that day, he set a record, a world's record, that was not broken for 30 years. You see, the Lord's given a marvelous promise with that commandment. He says, and all saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments, shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint, shall receive hidden treasures of knowledge, and I, the Lord, give them a promise that the destroying angel shall pass them by as the children of Israel and not slay them. Well, the Lord didn't fail him. He won't fail you. I can remember an occasion when I had a pressure on me, a young bishop away in a distant city. They have what they call a social hour, and they determined I was going to join them. I couldn't do that and be the bishop. And yet they, two of them stood by the door and said, okay, you're going to join us. You won't go out of here. I said a little prayer, Father in heaven, help me. You know, I walked right between them. They didn't see me go. It's just like the Lord had put a plastic bag over me, and it went right out. <laughs> and to this day, not one of them's asked where I went. The Lord never fails. All the other commandments, tithing, Sabbath day, all the commandments, they form this protective power. And I want to tell you, when you walk with the Lord, you walk in safety and protection. Let's move on now to the next one. He says, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How do you do that? Well, to me, that means having kept the commandments so that your habits have been formed to work for you and not against you. You see, our body is a marvelous thing, and when you do a thing over and over, you can set up a habit pattern. You know, I can uh, one day used to be able to typewrite, and you know, you could think and read something else and still write, and your fingers would do it, and you didn't have to tell them where to go. You see, you can set up a habit pattern, and if we have the habit pattern set up of praying every day, we have the habit pattern set up of uh, searching the Scriptures and doing it the Lord asks, it'll be harder to quit doing it than the will to do it. So I just say, if we have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that would mean that we've been keeping the commandments, and the habits are working for us. Let's move to the next one. Taking the shield of faith. Now, a shield is something that usually goes on your left arm, it's put right on the forearm, and you can hold it up to keep arrows. In the old days of the nights, you could keep arrows and stones and rocks and maybe axes from coming at you. How do you build a a shield of faith to protect you against this invisible foe? Well, faith comes by hearing the Word of the Lord. You can hear the Word of the Lord when you read the Scriptures. You can hear the Word of the Lord when you hear His prophets. You can feel the Word of the Lord when you pray. You can build a faith. Let me just hurriedly walk through an experience of a young man that built a shield of faith. From the Old Testament, you could read about a young man named David herding his father's sheep. He talked about a time when his confidence and trust in the Lord reached a point that when he uh, tried to protect the sheep, when a bear attacked him and a lion attacked him, that the Lord delivered him out of the paw of a bear and out of the paw of the lion. A day came when his father, Jesse, said, take some food down to your brothers who are fighting in the army for Saul. And he took some loaves, and he took some cheese, and he took some parched corn and went down. And when he got down there, he saw this giant of a Philistine challenging the armies of Israel, saying, if any of you dare come out and fight me, and if you win, we'll be your servants, and if I win, you'll be our servants. And not a man dared go. And David was offended, he thought. What's the matter with the army of the God of Israel? No one dares go. I imagine his brother said to him, Don't get too smart, young man. If you go down, he would cut you to ribbons or something. But at any rate, David decided he'd go. 
Can you just get this picture now? Here's a young lad, maybe 17, walking now down to meet this giant, probably 10 feet tall, with a spear that probably weighed more than David, and he had to, his shield was big enough that he had a shield carrier. And when he saw this lad coming at him, he was uh, offended. He said, Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? This day I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the fowls of the field. Now imagine that sound coming toward David. And what did he say? He says, I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. This day he will deliver you into my hands. That all people in the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And he goes along quietly, slips a little smooth stone into a sling, and with a practiced aim, he lets it go. And you know that day Goliath had something enter his head that hadn't been there before. <laughs> and you know he toppled and fell on his face. You see, David had built a shield, so it was a protection to him. And in this day, if we have a shield that will protect us against the, the fiery darts of the adversary, and you can build it by searching the Scriptures. You can build it by talking with the Lord in prayer. You can do it by listening to His prophets who speak under the power of the Holy Ghost. You can build a faith, but it only has to come when you, you have to obey the things you read. It's not just enough to read them and hear them. When you obey, the Lord says, when you do what I say, then I, the Lord, am bound. When you do not what I say, you have no promise. Then the next thing he says, put on the helmet of salvation. Now, you know, in a football game today, if a person didn't have a helmet on, he would only be good for about two plays, and he'd be, be through. Now, the Lord says, put the helmet on. What is the helmet? To me, the helmet is to know who you are and why you're here and what we can do. See the words of the primary song, I am a child of God, and He's sent me here. He's given me an earthly home with parents kind and dear. You see, when a person knows who he is and why he's here, he has a real advantage. And then the final thing the Lord says, take the sword of my spirit. Now, you know, often as I saw those swords hanging in the Warwick Castle and some of those other castles, Blendham Palace and one or two other places that Sister Eve and I were. There was a 36-inch stainless steel Williamson sword, just sharpened just like a razor on both sides. And I thought, my, if you're going to have to defend yourself against someone and you only had a little sword like that with about an inch blade on it, you wouldn't have much chance against a, pen, against a Williamson 36-inch sword. The Lord says to take the sword of His Spirit. And sometimes our sword may not be very big, but there's great power in it. Let me just give you a few of the words of the Lord. He said, Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word. And then, if you desire, your tongue shall be loosed, and you shall have my word and my spirit, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of men. Now the sons of Mosiah and, and, and Alma were out one day being transferred after they'd been in an area 14 years. And as they met one another, they said something like this, And what added more to his joy, they were still his brethren in the Lord. They were men of sound understanding, for they had searched the Scriptures diligently. But that's not all. They had searched the Scriptures diligently that they might know the Word of God. But that's not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. They had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. And when they taught, they taught with the power and the authority of God. Can you see what a marvelous thing it is if we are prepared, if we have the Spirit, if we're obedient, that we can do our part, that we can carry the burden the Lord's asked us to carry? It isn't easy. If it were easy, He wouldn't have sent you special young men and women here to do it. He's prepared you, held you back, trained you, made it possible for you to come in this day. I'd hope there won't be one of you that would fail the Lord. I'd hope that you'd be true to this trust, that you'd put on the, this whole armor that the Lord has sent. Now, the Lord loves us, and he's, He can be as close as you'll let Him be. If I can for a moment or two, I'd like to give you a little feel about the Lord, this great being we serve. I don't know how close your relationship is to Him. 
But you know you can be as close, he'll be as close to you as you'll let him be by how you feel and how you act. Sister Eve and I had a marvelous experience in this, ex this opportunity we had going from Johannesburg, South Africa to London. It was possible to stop in the Holy Land. We were, uh, we were told we could stop one time, and Sister Eve and I prepared ourselves. We'd searched every word that was written about the Savior that we could find. We went through all this, the Gospels. We didn't want to miss anything. You know, I'd been hearing President Lee talk about how he felt when he stood at the garden tomb. I'd heard President Kimball talk about the feelings he had when he was on Shepherd's Hill where they administered the sacrament. I wanted to see if I could prepare myself sufficiently that I could feel those same feelings. And so Sister Eve and I were there in the Holy Land. And we had this marvelous opportunity now to walk where Jesus walked. I walked today where Jesus walked. <clears throat> we had an opportunity to come out of the room where they had the, the Last Supper, down off the Mount of Olives, across the Brook, Brook Cedron, into the area where they say the Garden of Gethsemane is. In my mind's eye, I could picture this lone figure out there now, about a stone's throw away from these three apostles whom he had left at the gate to watch. And as I looked, I could see him suffering. I could see him prostrate on the ground. And I began to feel a, a, a kinship to him and saying, why is he doing that? Why does he suffer like that? He didn't need to do it himself. And this truth came in, into my mind, he's doing it for you. And when I realized that part of that suffering was because of me and my transgressions, I began to have new feeling and new love, greater gratitude for the Son of God. And when I dwelled on the words when he described the suffering to us in our day, he said, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to suffer both body and spirit and to bleed at every pore and wish that I might not drink that bitter cup and shrink. When I realized that he had suffered this extensively, and he'd done it for me, and then to have these heathen soldiers come, 600 of them, and the Scripture says they bound him. Can you imagine the Son of God being led like a common animal down to be judged in an illegal trial at night? As he would stand there in Annas' palace, they would smite him on the face. You remember his words? He said, he said Why smitest thou me? They would smite him and review, uh, re revile him and say, if you're the Son of God, why don't you prophesy who smote you? They took him before Caiaphas, and there they determined he should die. Caiaphas couldn't take his life. They had to send him before Pilate, and four times Pilate tried to turn him loose. He couldn't find anything wrong in him. He says, I find no sin in this just man. And still they clamored for him. So finally, it may be his one last attempt, he sent him down to be scourged. It isn't written in the scriptures. All it says is they were sent to be scourged. But I thought in my mind, probably he thought if he sent him down to be scourged and he came forth beaten and bruised and bleeding, that they might soften their hearts and they might let him go. Sister Eve and I stood in the chamber where they scourged people. It almost makes your blood run cold to see what they do. Hands tied, legs tied so you can't fall down, and then clothing taken from the back, and then 39 flogs are administered across the back. They have little reservoirs to hold the salt water to retain the, that they can use to restrain the bleeding if it gets too profuse as they administer the scourging. As I envisioned in my mind this suffering that the Son of God had, and then to have him take him and mockingly put a purple robe on him, and then lead him away up this little path they call Via Della Rosa, up to where they say he was crucified. As I stood there in my mind's eye, I could almost hear the nails being driven into his hands. And this great being had no ill feeling in him. I thought, what would I do if I were there? And you know, I'd have fought back and I'd have failed. I am so grateful he was so great and marvelous and wonderful he didn't fail. And even in the last terrible hour, when he had to be left alone, Probably the greatest trial he had to be, have the Father withdraw his spirit. And the Father withdrew his spirit because he had to do it himself. I'm so grateful Heavenly Father didn't stop it, 
You know, if he'd have stopped it and, we, and uh, he'd have left us without rendering the service he rendered, we would never have had a body again. Our body would have gone to the grave, never to rise. Our spirit would have been subject to Lucifer forever. And no matter what we did, we'd have been subject to him forever. My, I'm so grateful for the strength of this great being who's the Son of God. And in godly dignity, he gave up his life. They didn't take it from him. After the suffering, all this immense suffering, which even was sufficient that he caused him to cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even with this great suffering, he still was able to, in dignity, give up his life. And after standing all of it, he said, Father, it is finished. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Well, I testify to you today that he lives, that he's real, that he guides this church. There's no question. You can hear him speaking through President Kimball. You not only can hear him, you can feel him. You can, and you can see it in his face. Everyone that was at conference, there was no question about those where I was in the conference. This great prophet, five foot six, six, standing there, hardly enough strength to stand up, just saying two or three sentences. The work is divine. God lives. The church is true. All is well. Wasn't anyone in that congregation that didn't know that the Lord had spoken through this great man, just those few words. Isn't it great to live in this day when his, when the heavens are opened, when there's revelation, when there's guidance? Wouldn't it be tragic now if we fail in our part? We have a vital part. We have the opportunity now to send this message across the earth. And there are thousands, there's millions of people waiting for this message. And if we fail, Unless the Lord sends someone else to replace us, they'll lose the blessings. I'd hope and pray that we won't fail the Lord in these trying times, that we won't be caught in Lucifer's net, we won't be caught in his snare, that we'll keep ourselves clean and sweet and pure and obedient so the power of the Holy Ghost can walk with us. What a marvelous thing it is to be when your minds turn completely to the Lord. The Lord said to sanctify ourselves. Let your mind be single to me. That means to put all the other things out. And when he comes first in our lives, he becomes a moving, motivating power. Well, I testify to you that he lives. I'd like you to know that there's no hesitation, there's no doubt. I know with every fiber of my being, every cell in my body, I know that God lives. I know that he guides this work. I know that he's alive. I know you can talk with him. I know that he hears. I know that he loves us. I know that he's there. In fact, I know that he's as close as you'll let him be. May God bless you and bless us all that we may not fail. Days are short. If I had one wish, I'd wish I could be as young as you are. I've only got a few left. I just, I've been, this yesterday was to attend a, attended two funerals of my friends. When you begin to see there's only a few days left, you're anxious to do all you can. I'd hope all of you might put your energy in and move forth with new vigor, new energy, that we might follow the guidance of the prophet when he said, lengthen your stride, hasten your step, increase your efficiency, do just a little more. That's the instruction we're laboring under. May God bless you and be with you in the days ahead. And I pray that he will, that you will have a desire to draw close to him so that this people will stand out, that we'll be the people that Isaiah saw when he said, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the tops of the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And they shall say, come, let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob that we may learn of his ways and walk in his paths. We're in that day. May God bless us that we won't fail that those who are watching us from behind the scenes will be pleased with what they see. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.